Let you meet these young people. These are this is my freshman class. This is a good group. Uh, my associate advisor, Charmin, you can go ahead and tell them, tell her, and then just go around, folks, yeah. and then uh, mm -hmm. tell her what you're doing and where you're from. I'm really interested in that. Um, my name is Charmin Zabi, and uh, I'm a junior here. I'm majoring in brain cognitive sciences, mm -hmm. biology, and philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. I'm from Chicago. She didn't have enough to do, so she thought three majors. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm from Chicago. Uh -huh. um, I'm Stephanie Barry. I'm from Birmingham, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And um, I'm majoring in either bio or brain cognitive science. Uh -huh. And you are a freshman? Yeah, I'm a freshman. So you don't have to really decide at this point. Uh, not, not uh -huh. uh, my name is Todd Willing, and I'm from Northeast Alabama. And I'm How did I know that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, plan to major in course six. Uh -huh. My name is Drew Starr. I'm from Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Where? Long Meadow, Mass. I don't know where that is. Right next to Springfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm planning on majoring anything from 7 to 9 to 10 to 15. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Riaz. I'm from Kenya. Mm -hmm. I plan to major in class 6 plus mm -hmm. management. Very good. What part of Kenya? Mombasa. Mm -hmm. My name is Fernando Ceballos. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. I plan to major in courses. Mm -hmm. I'm Joanna Bonventry. I'm from Wayland, Mass. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I think really one of the hidden uh, treasures of MIT is the freshman curriculum. You may not feel that now. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think other universities would really give their eye teeth to have all the freshmen studying the same thing, more or less, that you can talk to one another and don't have this feeling of kind of centrifugal forces, which they don't understand. You do. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's good. I mean, it gives you a whole year to decide what you want to do, and at the same time, you're making important academic progress. So well, I think that's fine. What they just watched. What can is, I do? Yeah, they just watched the distillation of mm -hmm. a couple of our mm -hmm. interview with those ladies mm -hmm. whom you mm -hmm. you know all. Yep, sure. Mm -hmm. Been there, yeah. done that. That's right. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like you to do is reflect upon your experience mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. as a woman at MIT, what it's mm -hmm. been like, mm -hmm. and uh, for all of the whole group. And I'm interested in you talking, mm -hmm. and they're asking mm -hmm. you questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, getting a sense of this place from that particular perspective. The one thing you heard a little bit is, would your perception be the same that uh, they were talking there about the experience? Sure. And, uh, sure. They went over how the numbers after uh, the bimodal distribution, after they got a certain critical mm -hmm. mass, that that disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that performance mm -hmm. just, the mm -hmm. women went straight mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, uh, I co-taught that seminar uh, for what is engineering with Millie Dressel right. House. I think that was an exciting experiment. It was interesting, um, my good friend, Norm Augustine, who recently retired as the CEO of Lockheed Martin, went to Princeton to teach. And uh, I asked him, I said, what are you going to teach? He said, well, he said, I think I'll offer a freshman seminar called What is Engineering? I said, great idea. Let me give you some advice. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed it. And uh, you know, I think it did have a big impact on MIT. But let me back up just a little bit, because I can do this kind of personal retrospective, because I was there. Um, I came to MIT as a freshman in 1956. And I, I'm from Tacoma, Washington. And uh, I only began to realize how strong those, those influences were. Um, two things about coming from Tacoma I think were important. One is that my uh, family's home was on the uh, final approach to McCord Air Force Base. So the sky was literally always full of planes. The second thing is that the larger, largest employer in the Northwest is Boeing Aircraft. Um, and so I think it didn't take me too long to figure out that, although I didn't commit myself when I was a freshman, but by the end of my freshman year, I knew I wanted to major in aeronautical engineering. And I think that, that a lot of that had to do with coming from Tacoma and uh, having every anticipation of returning to the Northwest.
and uh, working for Boeing, designing airplanes. Why did you come here? What was the uh, attraction of MIT? Well, I had been involved in the local science fair. I'd won the local science fair. I was recruited by a very active MIT educational counselor. Um, I have to say I was more actively recruited by MIT than any other school. University of Chicago said, uh, well, why should we give you a scholarship? You'll just get married and it uh, won't work. Well, I was absolutely insulted by that uh, remark. And, uh, you know, Stanford, Caltech didn't take women. Uh, Stanford, you know, was just noncommittal in the sense, you know, you send in your application, they'll let you know. Uh, MIT was fiercely aggressive at recruiting. We had a whole bunch of uh, freshmen coming from Seattle. I think we had a total group of 20. Um, we had a meeting in Seattle with all the incoming students and the alumni from Seattle. And um, they picked me um, as a result of this very energetic guy from Tacoma to give their sort of central scholarship to. So I was very well treated by MIT. I was very well treated by the Seattle alum. And you know, I really felt that I was coming to a place that was really anxious to have me. And you know, that's always a turn on. So uh, that's why I came to MIT. I really didn't know anything about the East. Uh, didn't particularly like it. Um, and vowed never to stay here. <laughs> well, so much for <laughs> two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> uh, but the thing that surprised me when I arrived at MIT was sitting around the freshman or the women's dorm in those days, there were only 20 of us who had made this decision out of all the women in the United States. There were only 20 women who decided to come to MIT. I found that a little startling. I hadn't thought much about it, but uh, I had realized the numbers would be so small. Um, I guess I made a fundamental decision at that point that if I was going to worry about that, that I was not going to graduate. So I basically just sort of plowed through without asking myself the question, you know, um, was this a good place for women? Um, you know, why aren't there more women? Um, why was I here? You know, which people used to ask me all the time. I said, I'll, check, I'll get back to you later. Um, so I didn't worry about it. I just sort of plowed right through and, and uh, was very successful academically. Um, I did take a little while to spin up. I mean, my first semester at MIT, we had grades in those days. First semester at MIT, uh, where by most measures was, was successful, but I basically got a B in everything. So I got a B average, and that put me on what was then the dean's list. But it was not a spectacular performance. But then it was sort of going up after that. And I actually had a couple of semesters where I got, you know, the coveted 5-0. <laughs> uh, but I had, a, I had a marvelous time. I mean, the art department was a great department. It's very, um, very uh, faculty student oriented. I mean, you know, I had faculty who just were tremendously supportive. Holt Ashley was my advisor. And Holt took the place of the guy from Tacoma who, you know, was my champion, my mentor. Um, was always putting me forward for awards and everything like that. And as I think about it, throughout my life, I think I have accumulated about 10 or 12 what I would view as mentors, people who have really taken it upon themselves to be my sponsor. And uh, I guess I draw an important lesson from that, that all of you will have people like that. And you will also be people like that. You, having been sponsored and mentored by somebody will then have a responsibility to do the same for other people. Uh, but needless to say, I never did leave MIT. Um, I stayed here, and I am part of this whole history that's referred to on the videotape. I saw MIT, and didn't sit by and watch, but was an active participant in MIT going from basically 1% women to 43% women. Uh, there are a lot of watersheds in that, um, in that activity, the building the women's dorm, the sort of changing from admissions being limited by housing to, you know, more or less open admissions. The extremely important studies that Art Smith did uh, during, I don't remember when that was, the middle 70s or late 70s or middle 80s or whatever it was, that basically showed statistically that the math SAT scores under predict the performance of women relative to their, their senior accomplishments. 
And so if your goal is to graduate a class of seniors rather than admit a class of freshmen, then you should use that information, and MIT began to do that. And in one year went from 26% to 38% women. And it was a success, a women's grade point average, which is not the only measure of greatness, but uh, grade point average, a general success, uh, basically remained equal or better than that of the men. So, so this bold experiment worked. And I don't think any other university in the nation is as conscious of what that really means. I mean, first of all, I don't think MIT has publicized it. We've kept it. We haven't even told the students, which of course has created no end of problems. Uh, but you know, we haven't. We've been kind of quiet about it. Um, we know something that other universities don't really know, and, and we just haven't. You know, I think been as forthcoming and sharing. And characteristically it. modest. Well, it is, and I actually am a good friend of the president of Caltech and his wife Alice, and she's a, you know, major figure in in biology. And um, actually, we spent a weekend together about a month ago, more or less, and they would really like to understand how they can reshape their admissions process to have the kind of achievement that MIT has had. So I promised to send her the data. Um, and I promised to give her Mary Lee's uh, email address sure. so that she could figure out, because I think MIT really understands what it's doing with respect to admissions. And I think we see the result of that all around us in, in the character of the freshman class, the character of the senior class, and the accomplishments of uh, male and female students across the institute. It's a very different place. Even going down, uh, leaving the place for four years and coming back, it's a very different place as I come back. Even my own department is different. My own department, um, when I left, I was the only woman on faculty in the aero department. Roughly speaking, I think Dobbin Newman was just coming in at that point. Uh, now at this point, I can't even count the number of women in the faculty. And certainly if I, um, if I include the senior research staff uh, sort of principal scientists, people who teach and do research, it's probably 10, probably 10 people in my department. And it's not unusual to go to a meeting of our project and, and find virtually the entire room full of women. I happen to be working on a project called the Lean Aerospace Initiative, which deals with the streamlining and downsizing in the defense industry and industrial efficiency and acquisition reform and getting you know, equipment faster, better, cheaper. Uh, and, and using more commercial practices. So, um, as I said, we've got an exciting project and a substantial fraction of our team are senior women scientists, as well as women graduate students. We have a lot of women graduate students in, in the project. So MIT is a very different place. And ultimately, I think MIT's, and really set it on the tape, MIT's big contribution will be in its students. And the students that it trains uh, give, give our students the tools and the and the attitudes and the technique they need need for success, uh, not in a, only in a technical sense but in a leadership sense. So um, this been, this can be a good place for me. I, this uh, means that you all are here because you can do it and because and you are going to do it. See, right? You're yeah. Reaffirmed and all mm -hmm. of that. What was it like though going through that undergraduate and uh, program at that point in time? You know. Now, looking back, mm -hmm. you can see all the progress, but what sure. was the sense at that point? Well, uh, first of all, you know, I, you know, I've got a freshman seminar, too, so I tell them this. Um, first of all, MIT is a big intellectual jump. Maybe not as much. It so. really is. <laughs> I, mean, I know that the high schools have improved. So for many students, it's not as much of an intellectual jump as it was for me when I came. I came from a parochial high school, all-girls school, Catholic school. We didn't have physics. I had to get on the bus every afternoon and go down to the public high school to take physics. You recall that the faculty passed what I termed Widnall's Revenge. When, uh, when I was chairman of the faculty, we passed a rule that says physics is not an absolute requirement for admission to MIT. Although one person here took advantage yeah. of that. Right. Well, you, oh, you owe that to me because uh, in my daily bus trips down to, to take physics at the local high school, um, Anyway, I know most people do take physics, but and I came with physics. But uh, you know, obviously, in those days, I think the quality of the high schools for a place like MIT was just, you know, it was a whole different thing. And uh, so I think the uh, the initial shock was really like, you know, taking a bath in, in ice water. And I failed my first physics test. I got a 30. Many people also failed their first physics test. But 
that for me was a kind of a wake up, uh, a kind of one of these defining moments, because that certainly the experience of sitting in that test and realizing that I didn't, that I was not on the same same wavelength as the faculty, and then reflecting on that after, which I had about two hours to do, um, made me realize what MIT was really expecting, that it wasn't a matter of feeding back what you heard. It was a matter of creating something new, you know, solving a problem you had never seen before. And somehow I understood that, and I said, okay, so I understand. I understand what is expected. Uh, and, and from then on, I think I had a completely different appreciation of what MIT was and, and what the expectation was. And having figured it out, uh, proceeded to kind of charge ahead. Um, I had a, a fairly disciplined approach to MIT. I never pulled an all-nighter. I never stayed up all night. I never did. Um, I, being a fluid dynamicist, I know that time is incompressible. And that what you want to do is put yourself in a position where you're maximizing total system efficiency, which means the physical, <laughs> the mental, you know, the psychological, all of that. You've got, you know, you got to get yourself in a situation where you're maximizing total system efficiency. And I don't, you know, I mean, maybe you, you get an emergency once in a while, but I mean, on as a regular basis, you've got to take care of yourself. You've just got to keep, keep yourself um, so that you can perform. And, um, and there are various ways to do that. How did your female peers cope? Not well. <laughs> I would say in general, not well. Uh, we had some very unfortunate things happen. First of all, we we had more women come than MIT had planned for. So they put the, fortunately I was not one of the women, but they put half of the women in a temporary living situation over on, um, I think it was Marlboro Street. They rented a brownstone, they put them over there. They put me and a bunch of others in the women's dorm. In about November, I think the landlady decided that the girls weren't keeping their rooms clean. And she th literally threw them out on the street. She took their belongings and put them out on the street. Well, MIT had to do a little catch-up ball. And it, put, uh, it found temporary uh, accommodations for many of those women students in the BU dorms. Um, but the study conditions are not adequate. I mean, the BU women students and MIT women students don't have that much in common. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of those women students slunked out. I mean, it was, including my very best friend. I mean, I had a friend who was um, put in that situation and she flunked out. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a happy story. I think it was probably that incident as much as any that convinced MIT that it, that if it was going to have women students, it had to do it right. And I think that was one of the motivations for basically going over to, it's a famous story, Killian and Stratton get in a cab and go over to see Mrs. McCormick and talk her into, uh, you know, building a women's dorm. Of course, little did we know that co-ed dorms would soon become, yeah. you know, sure. popular. I mean, you know, we didn't see that. We didn't know that was coming. So. Uh, you know, the housing problem ultimately solved itself in lots of different ways. But the initial step in that was, was the women's dorm. So, no, MIT was a very demanding place, and a lot of, a lot of people, um, you know, had difficulty with it. So you took your degree here and then? I stayed. You stayed. And right? I stayed, and, and I stayed, stayed, and I stayed. Right. Okay, I've only been away from MIT for two periods in Washington. I went down in 1974. Um, where I served as the director of university research for the Department of Transportation. And that was another one of these mentor things. I had acquired a mentor along the way, just even was a t touch and go mentor. Uh, I didn't really, you know, because he was actually the, uh, he was Bob Cannon actually, he used to be in our mechanical engineering department. Met him several times. He was um, then the um, assistant secretary uh, at the Department of Transportation, and he asked me to come 
come down and, uh, and run this program. And just before I got there, he left to become Dean of Engineering at Caltech. And he called me from his cellular phone on the way out of Washington saying, well, have a good time. I just want you to know that I won't be here. <laughs> it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me, you know, because then I was totally independent. I didn't have somebody to take care of me. I had to do everything myself. So it was a real learning experience. And of course, obviously, the other time was, was going down to Washington and being Secretary of the Air Force, which uh, was a tr truly incredible experience. Really incredible experience. Let's get to that. Another so, mentor. Well, like, yeah, I want to talk relationship. about that. Mm -hmm. I wanna, but you did, uh, you, you know, you married and, uh, you know, your life was beyond MIT. Yeah, well, that's right. I have How does that happen children. in this, that's right, in this have to work very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I would never, you know, minimize the difficulty of, of basically having it all. I mean, I think, I think it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of organization, and, and it's uh, taking on a lot of responsibilities. Um, but I see more and more people doing it. I think the world has changed in rather dramatic ways. I think I see, you know, many more um, dual career couples, you know, making things happen. It even affects us in the Air Force. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I think the Air Force is having a pilot retention problem is that the expectations have changed. Uh, it is no longer the expectation that, you know, the guy will go off and fly in Saudi Arabia and that the rest of the family will just sit there and wait. They're not content to sit there and wait. And he's not content to do that either. He wants to be with his family. So I think that what I see happening all over the country is that there's a real change, that there's a sharing, there's more of an equal partnership. And uh, the Air Force has got some major challenges figuring out how to accommodate these really new realities in families and the way people want to uh, have a family, want to be together, want to share responsibilities. That's not just an issue for people at MIT, it's an issue for everybody all over the country and it's a major change in the way uh, we think about our responsibilities. And, and so, um, yeah, I think, I think it'll get easier. I think it'll get easier because it's, it's just, you know, much more, much more the expectation that uh, people will have, you know, fuller, richer lives and there will be a lot more sharing. Millie talks about in uh, other conversations we've had about how this place was not very sensitive to the needs of uh, a woman with children and scheduling mm -hmm. and uh, how mm -hmm. she had to, mm -hmm. and how, in fact, she tells some stories in our conversations about another woman who came on the faculty or came as a research mm -hmm. scientist mm -hmm. at the same time she did, and like your friend, just simply couldn't make it and try to do what she had yeah. to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did that work for you? How did you? I never had any. Um, I never had any special favors. I mean, I don't know how to say this exactly. I mean, I, I, I was always a tomboy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you come into my office and you'll see my picture of me and my flight seat and everything like that. I, I only stayed away for two weeks when I had my children. I just was full steam ahead. Um, I didn't, um, you know, expect any, any, um, accommodation and I never asked for it. Mm -hmm. Bill, of course my husband Bill, was enormously helpful. I mean we are, um, you know, probably more like today's young people are than our contemporaries. Although I have to say, you know, that I really notice a big change between the class of 60 and the class of 59 at MIT. I go to both reunions because my husband's in 59 and, and I'm in 60. And 60, the class of 60 is much more, I don't know how to say it, committed to equality. They, they, they accept women as full and equal participants in, in their lives, in their work, in whatever they do. Class of 59 is just a little conservative. I find them just a little, because there were, you know, the, the number of women in that class was very, very different. Uh, they weren't as mainstream, I think, as the women in the class of 60. And then I think from then on, I think there was a change. I think there was a change. And I think I see that reflected in the Alumni Association, people who went to MIT at these different times. So I really believe there was a watershed between 59 and 60 in, uh, in what was going on at MIT. And it wasn't, you know, just me. I mean, we had Linda Greiner. Linda Greiner was uh, editor of the ETAC. 
Um, so we had, we had many women students who were you know, in very substantial leadership positions. So the whole, the whole climate, uh, I think, for women students at MIT changed during, during those times. Questions, folks? Here's your chance. Mm -hmm. um, even today, like, families are hesitant about sending their daughters to uh, away to college. How did your mm -hmm. family and the families of your peers feel about sending their daughters away to college? Well, uh, these, these are cultural issues. There's no question about it. But um, I had a very unusual family. First of all, I was the oldest girl of a family of girls. And I think if you look back statistically at families like that, you will find that the oldest girl is often the surrogate son. I mean, that just happens. Um, so, so I was absolutely encouraged in everything I did. Also, my mother was another real pioneer. My mother worked. She worked all the time I was growing up. She quit work to be at home with me when I was starting to school. And I, she drove me crazy. <laughs> and I said, Mother, for heaven's sakes, go back to work. <laughs> so my mother was a social worker during the Depression. Uh, she, she managed cases of people who were on welfare. And then after she went back to work, when I threw her out of the house, uh, she became a juvenile probation officer. So she you know, had a very active career, and she worked with families that were disintegrating kids that were in trouble, either um, because their families were disintegrating or because they'd become delinquent. So, so she worked the whole time that I was. So my models, my models were uh, of, you know, women who basically combined career and, and family. Um, and my father was, uh, you know, very interesting. He did all sorts of different things, but uh, he, he was a rodeo cowboy when he met my mother. So, I mean, just strong family. Very strong family, very oh, supportive. Cowboy. Yes. Yes. That's, that's unusual. Yes, it is unusual. It is unusual. But great guy. I miss him so much. Passed away just before I became Secretary of the Air Force, so he never knew. Yeah, I love, I love that guy. He was just my first mentor. Wonderful man. Very supportive. We built things together. That's really why I'm an engineer. Daddy and I built things. I was 21 years old before I realized you could hire people to come to your house to fix things. <laughs> no, it never occurred to me. I mean, we always, we not only fix things in our house, we fix things in the neighbor's house. <laughs> One of the new neighbors came over, knocked on the door, and, and said, uh, can Roland come over and fix my sink? And my mother was taken aback. She says, he doesn't do things like that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Mr. Brayman said that he was the guy who fixed everything in the neighborhood. <laughs> so anyway, that's why I'm an engineer, probably as much as anything, is that, you know, hands-on hands-on experience. All right, Stanley, you've got Here, let me see what's going on here. No, that's fine. Go ahead and uh, you guys don't lose this moment. Okay? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Questions? Don't be shy. Women should speak up. <laughs> what about the families of your peers? Oh, well, first of all, I went to a girls' school. Um, so I think, I think women who go to girls' schools are often more independent than women that go to sort of co-educational high schools. Um, I think that's statistically true. Um, I think that uh, I, I, my friends were a very independent bunch of girls. Um, and, um, you know, I think you know, most of them did go to college someplace. Most of them stayed pretty close to Washington. Uh, I was clearly the, the out, outlier, but um, no, I think people were very supportive of, of their, uh, their daughters. When you, um, when you got to MIT, um, I know here now that it's really pretty supportive for women. It, you know, there's not much of a difference, but was there, um, when you first came, was there any resentment with um, the women students? Well, you know, MIT is very layered. I mean, there's the faculty, there's your fellow students, there's the upperclassmen. I mean, it's it's probably impossible to general, generalize. Um, I think my department was very supportive. So if I could make it through my freshman year and get to my sophomore year, 
I found a group of faculty who were extremely supportive, very anxious to have me here. I think in my freshman year, well, actually, there was there were some faculty members who really went out of their way to be supportive. Mm -hmm. I remember in particular my math professor, Professor Douglas, whose name is one of those hallowed names around mm -hmm. MIT, um, who really was very supportive. I mean, I still remember taking a quiz in 1801 and having him, I mean, he was this great old grandfatherly guy, and he came up to me and says, can I go out and get you a Coke or something? You know, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that was terrific. You know, he just, you know, I didn't really need a Coke, but I just thought that, that he was just tremendously supportive. So he was, was really good, and that's a good feeling to have about an instructor because, you know, they can be a little terrifying. Um, but, you know, when, when they're approachable like that. So, yeah, I would say that there were a few people who were, you know, really approachable. And, and uh, incidentally, I took uh, 1802 from Professor Maddock, who I understand is still teaching 1802. But, no, I, f I found the faculty either um, didn't pay any attention to me at all mm -hmm. or were supportive. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was particularly true in the aero department. I had some really strong... Uh, supporters, and um, you know that that um, so I says I guess that's it. It was either being ignored, which was not bad for a student, or being supported. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. And with my classmates, um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I think I I was asked a lot. You know, what are you doing here? Um, I chose not to worry about that issue, um, but I used to go out a lot. Too. So, I mean, you know, that's one of the advantages of being only 1%. Uh, uh, more dates. Um, and um, my husband's still kidding me about all the, all the guys I flunked out. Because, you know, I could handle the extracurricular stuff better than they could typically. So, but this was for you the home you needed to find, right? I think so. I think of MIT as my home. I mean, I've been here more of my life than I've, than I've been uh, in Tacoma, and I think I've really uh, made contributions to this community. I was chairman of the faculty, I was chairman of the admissions committee, I was chairman of the discipline committee, um, I served in a lot of important roles on the faculty, I certainly served um, as a policymaker in issues having to do with, with women students, the admission of women students. So. And there are people who think that, uh, that you you know, you might even someday be the first woman president of this place. I think I'm a little too old to well, think I mean, about that. Maybe, but that's uh, for you to worry about. Others, I still hear tossing that around occasionally. What about the Air Force? How did you find that experience? I mean, uh, was that just MIT writ large, or was that different? Oh no. <laughs> Very different. Uh, yeah, no. I think it was. It was different. Um, let's see. It's hard to describe how I got there. I mean, that was basically another relationship, another mentor relationship. I had been on the board of the Carnegie Corporation, and uh, David Hamburg is the president of the Carnegie Corporation, and he was one of my Im really important mentors. And uh, Warren Christopher, who became Secretary of State, was the chairman of that board. And Warren, Chris was uh, doing a lot to, to construct the administration. And I was sitting in the office over in the provost's office there where, where I was, and uh, David Hamburg called me up and he said, Sheila, he said, I've got an absolutely great idea. And I called up Senator Nunn and, and uh, Mr. Aspen, who was about to become Secretary of Defense. And they think it's a great idea, too. He said, I think you should be Secretary of the Air Force. And I said, David, I said, that is an absolutely super idea. So, uh, you know, after that, it just all kind of fell into place. Um, you know, in terms of. You were of, taken with the idea of me. Well, I had always wanted to be Secretary of the Air Force. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, it really. Had uh, they known that, or was this? Well, no, I never mentioned it to anybody, but, okay. um, you know, I had. Bob, I mean, I had known at least half of the previous Secretaries of the Air Force. They had been aeronautical engineers. Uh, Bob Siemens was even a member right. of our department. Uh, but I'd served on uh, the Aerospace Board where Pete Aldrich was the former secretary. I knew John McLucas and, and Joe Cherrick and, you know, just Don Rice. And, yeah. you know, I'd known a lot of the previous secretaries of the Air Force. And they had backgrounds that were not unlike mine. And so it's actually a job I've always wanted. So I thought it was a terrific job. And, uh, you know, I really liked it. Um, it's a very complicated organization. 
with a budget of, you know, roughly $60 billion. And, uh, you know, 400000 active duty and uh, another 200000 reserve. And, uh, you know, roughly uh, 175,000 civilian full-time employees. Plus, um, you know, the Pentagon, which is like no place uh, that I've ever been. Um, and, you know, the relationships between the political side and the military side and, and uh, policy making. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a very complicated environment. It's not unlike MIT in the sense that in order to get something done, you have to build consensus. Um, I think that people from industry going into that situation often had a, have a hard time. Because people from industry often think that all you have to do is give an order and something happens. That's not the way Washington works. Right, so I do think actually academics um, do very well in that environment because there's a lot of consultation. Um, there's a lot of sort of building consensus. Um, I think the intellectual issues are very important. Um, and you have to be able to work with large groups of people and, and, you know, kind of get all the ideas and get it sort of framed and get it sort of down to some consensus. And uh, so a lot of the tools that I um, learned at MIT were extremely useful. And I think in dealing with the people, I actually think my background as an educator was more useful than my background as an engineer. Because, I mean, in, in the end, it really is about people. And I think people who are in education focus on people. You focus on career development. Uh, one of the big things I did in the Air Force that I'm probably the most proud of is, is uh, core values. You know, we basically articulated and, and, and stressed the core values of the Air Force. And an institution like MIT has got core values, too. In fact, they're almost the same core values, um, although the air, core values of the Air Force are integrity, service above self, and excellence. I think the only one that MIT doesn't have is the service above self, because service above self really implies perhaps putting your life on the line for your country and, and uh, unless you join the military I think that that's probably not an expectation that you would have but your kind of service goes in a different way it is service to country it's service to community uh, it's service service to the nation service to your family so I mean there is a service component it's not quite as sharply drawn as it would be for somebody in the military what about being a woman well, you know, there's some interesting psychological things associated with that, which I took full advantage of. Um, <laughs> there's, um, there's a book that I would recommend. Um, it's called Women Warriors. And basically what it points out is that throughout history, there have been a few women who have served in roles like this. Um, and that for the people involved, it can be a time of renewal. That there is something inherently exciting about a woman leader in a military situation. And that you can get the kind of energy in that situation that is an order of magnitude larger than the kind of conventional setting. And you know, Joan of Arc is the obvious uh, example, but in the British uh, myth, there's uh, somebody called Bodesha who, who also played that role. And in our own time, we had Golda Meir and Indira Gandhi and we had Margaret Thatcher. And so basically what I saw is that there was an opportunity uh, to energize the organization and uh, that I was about to take full advantage of it on their behalf to make them better. So I emphasized, um, you know, being a woman. I, uh, I wore, you know, flight suits all the time. I wore BDUs. I wore, you know, because that, that brings this energy forward in the organization. And it, I, I think it worked. I think it worked. I think we had uh, a very, very high-powered, intense organization that was totally focused on the mission, was totally focused on the core values. I think we just absolutely improved the organization. And, and I was very conscious of that. I mean, I was conscious of that opportunity uh, and those possibilities. And I think, I think, um, for the most part, we were able to accomplish that.
So I, I think that there's some real advantages to doing that. Do you that. think you would have done differently looking back on that? Oh. Stay longer? No, no, no. Uh -uh. You were going to come back? No, no. I mean, I, I think they say in Washington that if you're not going to stay for eight years, you should only stay for four. I think there is an expectation that when you get to the second four-year term that um, the people who have positions like mine uh, will basically retire so that the president can kind of put in a whole new team. And, and um, I think for me it was fine. And, and I think MIT was extraordinarily generous to give me four years leave of absence. There were people down there from Harvard and Kennedy School who basically had to resign their positions in order to be able to stay for four years. And uh, I think most of them successfully went back. But there are a lot of examples of universities not taking people back after. Robert they, Reich. Was well, there's Reich and uh, um, what's that guy's <coughs> name during the Vietnam War? Rostow. Yeah, Walt Rostow. Rostow. Walt Rostow did not get back to Harvard after four years. So um, I think MIT was extraordinarily generous. And, and um, so I think four years was the right amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, does it, this may sound weird, does it ever get to you um, to be thought of as like a woman in this, a woman in that? And, when, and, and ever do you say like, well, why can't I just be, you know, an engineer, why can't I? No, no. <laughs> it really doesn't because I always see it as a net plus. I, I always see it as a net plus. Um, I really believe that because I am a woman that I have typically been appointed to things at a younger age than might have otherwise been the case. Uh, you know, I've been able to, you know, in other words, I, I, I you know, I have a lot more visibility in my field because I'm a woman. Now, obviously, the visibility has to be backed up with competence. Um, but I think visibility is, is a good thing to have. So, no, I've, it's, never, it's never been an issue for me. Um, I've, um, you know, I am who I am, and, um, you know, I get asked to do things, and I, and I accept some, and don't accept others, and, and I just try to do the best job. So, no, that's never been an issue. But we just may come from a different time, different time. But I've never been self-conscious about it. What do you think, Drew? Hmm. Questions for that? Well, when you went to the, um, I got to Air Force and came back to mm -hmm. Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Was there a period of readjustment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I'm still readjusting. Um, the Air Force is tremendously well organized. And I had a staff of roughly 12 to 15 people whose entire job it was to see that I got to where I needed to go with what I needed to have. And um, so I had tremendous staff support, and um, and they were wonderful people. I mean, I I thought of them as graduate students because they were so smart, <laughs> and they were so productive, <laughs> and you know they were always writing papers and writing speeches and and uh, you know doing very very useful things. Uh, I miss them all terribly. I mean, I just um, as I say, they really were more like my graduate students. Uh, so coming back, you know, I'm, I'm setting my own schedule. Um, I'm involved with other organizations that are not as well organized as the Air Force. Um, I'm Vice President of the National Academy of Engineering. I'm on the governing board of the National Research Council and uh, on several organizations down there. And, and uh, I sent an email down there the other day and I said, you know, I'm really having a hard time linking into my responsibilities in your organization. I said, you never give me the agenda until about two weeks before the meeting. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I never know what's going on. I said, you never, I said, you've got to let me know six weeks and six months in advance when you're having meetings. I said, because my calendar fills up. You know, I just can't, I, it's very hard for me to deal with an organization that is not w as well organized as the Air Force. You know, in the Air Force, you know, I always knew exactly what I was doing, uh, where I was going, why I was doing it, and you know, we all had everything all lined up. And now I'm just kind of floating around trying to, fulfill my responsibilities to a lot of organizations that are not 
terribly well organized. And that that's that's difficult. That's difficult for me. But what are the intensity level compared to MIT? Pardon? The intensity level compared to... No, it's, I think it's much, much higher. Because basically it's the difference between one person trying to, you know, work her way through a complex organization and being at the pointy end of a spear that's like, you know, a couple thousand people all pushing in, in the same direction. So, you know, I had, I had four people whose job it was just to make sure that I used my time efficiently. And I hardly know the things that didn't happen because these guys took care of of those those issues uh, so I was um, I was just a you know my time was used a lot more effectively so that every day was um, you know had the kind of intensity that goes along with you know using your time efficiently did you feel more relaxed <coughs> did you feel more relaxed since you came back to MIT or no, I thought it was more chaotic. It was more chaotic. I, I was perfectly relaxed. I mean, I can give you a little example. Um, when I was in the Air Force, I, I bicycled, bicycled 3,000 miles a year.